Hello and welcome. Good morning to you. It's Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show, the phone number. If you want to call in, be a part of the program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425, 877-973-7425. That's right. Yes. Uh, happy Hallmark holiday to you. Uh, today is Valentine's Day. Men, if you didn't realize it, yes, uh, you've got time. Go to your local florist shop. They're overwhelmed. There's a line out the door already. Or go to your local grocery store, get a box of chocolates. Too late for Sherry's Berries or anything like that. But you can go to your local. You you can actually shop local today. That's your excuse for procrastination is you want to shop local. You know, the real St. Valentine, he was a real person uh, in in the, the third century. Valentine was a Christian convert in Rome who helped uh, Christians and, in fact, engaged in Christian marriage rite rituals for uh, young Christians. He was caught, apprehended, and jailed. Uh, he, he was a curiosity given his noble background. The Emperor Claudius uh, took a curiosity and a liking to the guy. They became friends, though he was under Val- Valentine was under house arrest. Um, and Valentine made the, the terrible mistake of suggesting to the emperor that, in fact, Jesus Christ was a real person, uh, and Christianity was real and true, and the emperor should consider converting. That outraged Claudius, who ordered him stoned, and then he was, or well, first beaten with clubs, and then he was stoned to death and beheaded. You can actually, there's a church outside of Rome that uh, has his skull preserved. You can actually go see the the skull of the real Saint Valentine. Yes, he was he was stoned, uh, beaten, stoned, and and beheaded on February fourteenth in oh, was it two thirty six? I forget the exact date, but it's it's documented, it's traceable. There were a bunch of people who so there were at least five people named Valentine, uh, and they all get confused. But uh, we can by by lineage in in church history and and even Roman history, Rome did a pretty good job of documenting executions and whatnot, we can trace back to where Valentine's Day comes from to this particular guy. Uh, So what a romantic holiday. Hey, uh, let's celebrate the holiday of a man who was beaten, stoned to death and beheaded. Yes, I'm going to give you a box full of chocolate hearts. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I listen. I, I'm. I love my wife and my family, and I'm happy to celebrate Valentine's Day because it has become a tradition of its own. But I hate. I hate the Hallmark holidays. I have told my assistant, don't ever get me a, a a happy boss's day anything. I'm not getting you a happy executive assistant's day anything. I'm not. These are Hallmark holidays. They are scams designed by the Fortune 500 to make us shill out money. Um, shell out money, not shill money. Shell out money. And it, it's, it is the holiday equivalent of Common Core designed by the Fortune 500 to make us all little automatons to shell out money for them. I, I Nothing doing. And, and Valentine's Day should technically stick in that. But it is now it's become a global phenomenon and uh, we can move on from there. I'm sure that's more than you wanted to know. William Barr, the attorney general of the United States, sent a love letter to the president over the president's tweets. I want to get there. But first, I want to get to Maisie Hirono. Set the stage here. Maisie Hirono is the senator from Hawaii, the not quite bright senator from Hawaii. And what what is this? Uh, Let's see. My, My producer. He tells me, to be fair, no one is happy to work for me, so don't worry about getting a card from any of us. My former producer sent me this text, and now i got to go find a new producer. Such a jerk. Let's get to Maisie Hirono, the senator from Hawaii, who is more, who is smarter than my former producer. Attorney General Barr is not the, uh, the attorney general for the people. He definitely acts like he's the attorney general for Trump, which is why back in May of 2019, when Barr testified before the Judiciary Committee, I called on him to resign because it was clear that he had audition for the job, and that he put his thumb on the Mueller report so that people got the totally erroneous um, impression as to what the Mueller report findings were. And uh, he hasn't changed uh, in his desire to protect the president. So, yes, we need to hear from Barr, and let's hope that he at least testifies in the House. Okay, so you know this is this is the opposite of Lou Dobbs, by the way. So Lou Dobbs on when? Uh, Let me get my timeline right. Yesterday, so it was Wednesday on Wednesday on Wednesday. Poor old Lou Dobbs. First of all, um, stop with the just for men, please. 
but but Lou Dobbs on Wednesday said that William Barr was doing the Lord's work and on Thursday has decided that William Barr is an agent of the deep state out to undermine the president. Uh, Here's what William Barr said to ABC News. The U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia signed off on his name is on the recommendation that went in there. Yeah. How did that happen? Uh, On Monday, uh, he came by. Uh, to briefly chat with me and say that uh, the team very much wanted to recommend the seven to nine year to the judge. And, but he thought that there was a way uh, of uh, satisfying everybody and providing more flexibility. Uh, and there was a brief discussion of that. I was under the impression uh, that what was going to happen was very much that I had suggested, which is deferring to the judge and then pointing out various factors and circumstances. Uh, On Monday night, uh, when I first saw the news reports, I said, gee, the news is spinning this. This is not what we were uh, going to do. So you Uh, were surprised? I was very surprised. And uh, once I confirmed that that's actually what we filed, I said that night, Uh, to my staff that we had to get ready because we had to do something in the morning to amend that and clarify what our position was. I had made a decision that I thought was fair and reasonable uh, in this particular case. And uh, once the tweet occurred, the question is, well, uh, now what do I do? And uh, do you go forward with what you think is the right decision or do you pull back because of the tweet? And that just sort of illustrates how disruptive these tweets can be. So you're saying you have a problem with the tweets? Yes. Well, I have a, I have a problem uh, with some of some of the, the tweets. I'm happy to say that, in fact, the president has never asked me to do anything in a criminal case. Uh, however, to have public statements and tweets made about the department, uh, about uh, our people in the department, our, our men and women here, about cases pending in the department and about judges before whom we have cases uh, make it impossible uh, for me to do my job and to assure the courts and the prosecutors in the, in the department uh, that we're doing our work with integrity. Now, I want to I wanna walk back through that, by the way. <laughs> this is too funny. <laughs> Twitter follower of mine, Frank Carr, uh, referring to St. Valentine, says, I thought maybe he died by being struck in the holiday checkout line at Kroger. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's actually how Valentine died. Um, okay, on bar. Notice what he said at the beginning here. The, the, the prosecutor, the U.S. attorney, came to him on Monday said what they wanted the sentencing guidelines to be, uh, seven to nine years, and Barr said he would prefer it if they didn't set sentencing guidelines and would instead let the judge set the guidelines. And what he would prefer that the attorneys do is lay out criteria for the judge by which he can determine uh, stolen sentence as opposed to having the, the Department of Justice be involved with it. The U.S. attorney ignored the advice of his boss, the attorney general, filed the paperwork with seven to nine years, and Barr felt they had to do something. Now, why did Barr feel like they had to do something? Because he knew what the president's reaction was going to be. The reason Bob Barr, or Bob Barr, William Barr gets so much hostility from people like Maisie Hirono is that he understands the way this president works and he navigates the president's personality and he does so with greater competence than anyone else in the administration. Now, naturally, naturally, uh, the president of the United States uh, is is upset this morning and saying he has the right to to uh, make recommendations to his attorney general at any time. And, you know, he's right. Let, let, let me just tell you this. Um, in, in fact, hang on a second. I want to um, I'm going to pull up something here on the fly and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, let's go. Da, 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 da. Yes, 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 yes. Um, Article two, section one, clause one of the United States Constitution, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. That is Article 1. Now, 
Uh, in article, uh, let's see, uh, it goes through how he shall be elected, what his qualifications are, uh, his compensation, and now section two. Article one, section two, clause one. The president shall be commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices, and he shall have the powers to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. He shall have the power, this is Clause 2, Article uh, Section 2 of Article 2, he shall have the power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate and by the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, judges of the Supreme Court, and all officers of the United States whose appointments are not here and otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law, but the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior offices as they think proper and the president alone in the courts of law and the heads of departments. The president shall have the power to fill all vacancies that may occur during the recess of the Senate, yada, 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 yada. Again, the president, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. That is that there is one executive and all the powers of that executive are invested in a president. Now, what, what, what's, what's the deal with this? Well, because all executive power is placed in the hands of the president of the United States, his department heads act on his behalf. The department heads only have power by virtue of the president having power and the uh, and the Congress or the president delegating that power to those cabinet heads. Again, he uh, may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments. He may do all sorts of uh, things. The, the The president is in charge of them. He gets to appoint them. He gets to fire them at will. Remember back during the Bush administration, there was a big scandal uh, where Bush fired a bunch of U.S. attorneys at the end of his administration. And the Democrats, oh, cover up, cover up, cover up, cover up. No, actually what it was, it wasn't cover up. Uh, what it was is that there were... There were B and C listers waiting to become the A listers in various U.S. attorneys' offices around the country. Bush was on his way out. He wanted to get, uh, reward people who had been loyal to him by stepping them up to be U.S. attorneys, even if they were acting U.S. attorneys. So he dismissed a large number of U.S. attorneys, and the Democrats and much of the media immediately went to cover up, which wasn't the case. But the president of the United States does this, and, and the attorney general is one of those cabinet heads. He was one of the original. Who were the original cabinet heads? Uh, you had Secretary of State. You had Secretary of War. You had Secretary of Treasury. You had Attorney General, and you had Postmaster General, I believe, were the first five cabinet officers. Uh, Postmaster General, of course, spun off uh, later. But uh, the attorney general, one of the original cabinet heads. The Attorney General of the United States, his power flows from the president. He is inferior to the president. There's this idea by some liberal law professors, and some members of the Supreme Court have backed this, that the Attorney General is somehow uh, separate from and has powers uh, ancillary from, re relating to, but, but derived elsewhere from the president of the United States. No, that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution specifically says the executive power resides in the president. Uh, again, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. It does not say the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States and such other people as Congress may allow. No, the executive power is vested in a president. But there are departments, and the president gets to pick those departments by the, the advice and consent of the Senate, which is the state's agreeing that the president has picked the right person. That's who William Barr is. Uh, it, it is a fiction to suggest that the president can intervene. You may not like it, and if you don't like it, amend the freaking Constitution. Don't come up with a legal fiction to try to justify yourself. The president's allowed. But nonetheless, 
William Barr says he's not going to be bullied by the president, and he had a plausible reason for doing what he did. Now, he's doubling down on this. I want to play the rest of this. I'm rambling on trying to explain to you why the president could intervene if he wanted to, just so you understand the constitutionality of it. But there's more that William Barr said you need to hear. We'll get to when we come back. We'll take your phone calls as well. 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. A little more from William Barr, uh, his his rebuttal to the president of the United States. Mr. Barr, the president uh, does not like to be told what to do. He may not like what you're saying. Are you prepared for those ramifications? Of, of course, as I you know said during my confirmation, uh, I came in to serve as attorney general. Uh, I am responsible for everything that happens in the department, but the thing I have most responsibility for are the issues that are brought to me for decision. And I will make those decisions based on what I think is the right thing to do, and I'm not going to be bullied or influenced by anybody, and I said at the time, whether it's Congress, newspaper, editorial boards, or the president, I'm going to do what I think is right. And, uh, you know, uh, the, I think the, the, I cannot do my job here at the department uh, with a constant background commentary that, that undercuts me. So, just to be clear here, did you talk to the president at all about your decision regarding the recommendations? The recommendations on the, this case? Never. Anybody from the White House call you to try to influence you? No. There you have it, uh, a, a, an express statement of denial from William Barr. What, one more clip from Barr on this. Does the president have the authority to just direct you to open an investigation and you have to do it? Can you help people at home understand, can he do that? I think in, a, in, a, in, many, ca- in many areas, such as uh, that, that don't affect his personal interests. Terrorism. Terrorism or uh, fraud by a bank or, or something like that where uh, he's concerned about something. Uh, he, he can certainly say, you know, I, I think someone should look into that. That's, that's perfectly appropriate. Uh, if he were to say, you know, go investigate somebody because the, and, and you sense it's because they're a political opponent, uh, then an attorney general shouldn't carry that out, wouldn't carry that out. Having known you and covered you for years, you're not a person that responds a lot to criticism. But I, I, I am wondering, in this version of the job, you and the job, and when you hear people on Capitol Hill saying, Barr is acting more like the personal attorney of the president rather than the chief law enforcement officer, how irritated does that make you? And what do you say to those people? Well... You know, this goes back to the fact we are in a very polarized situation. And and so in that kind of situation, I expect a lot of low blows. And there are a lot of low blows, but I don't respond to that, as you say. Uh, but I do think that in the current situation, uh, as, I've, as I've said, uh, you know, the, the fact that the tweets are out there and correspond to things we're doing at the department, uh, sort of give grist to the mill, and that's why I think it's time to stop the tweeting about Department of Justice criminal cases. You know, good for William Barr saying this. There's a problem, though, as you might imagine. The Democrats don't believe it. Man, the media doesn't believe it either. There, there are all sorts of headlines today. The New York Times, CNN, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, MSNBC commentary. They've all got William Barr comes out swinging against the president, denouncing the president. It's all a pre-planned act. It's amazing how the media, you know, back during the 80s and the 90s, you had people on TV who were called criminologists. And they would essentially try to to tell you, explain to you what was going on in the Kremlin based on who stood next to whom and and, uh, who said what to whom in in different video and who was releasing statements and whatnot. And many of them we now know in hindsight got a lot of that stuff wrong. 
But there seems to be just the, this level of criminology operation in the media trying to deduce from inside the White House and the Attorney General what exactly is going on. And they are quite sure of themselves. And they're also quite wrong in many of these cases, I'm sure. Some of that when we come back and uh, the problems for Andrew McCabe because of all of this. You know, I, I want to read you an email from a friend of mine. I'll, I'll leave him out of it. Um, but but let me let me. Um, Actually, there, there's one. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally. I'm. This is this is me as a bad host here. But trust me, I, I'm a professional. Uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay. Um, here is the email from the friend of mine. It's unbelievable to me just how bad the networks are, including CNN. I was listening on the way into the office, and they had Doris Kearns Goodwin on to put historic context on the brushback pitch William Barr delivered to the president yesterday. When she came on, the first thing John Avalon said enthusiastically was, this is all we've been talking about for the last two and a half hours. It's amazing they can't even see how pathetic they are. Uh, there's coronavirus, Idlib, the Biden collapse, North Korea, Reinhardt, AB5, the Astros, gay marriage in Ireland, Ireland, on and on and on it goes. But they're actually proud and eager to admit they are completely driven by one small story. It's just insane. Uh, now, let me let me give you some of these, um, some of the breakdown of this. We'll get to the coronavirus here in a little bit. There's actually some some pretty horrifying news on the coronavirus we need to get to. Uh, Idlib. What is Idlib? In Idlib, uh, there has been massive attacks in Syria in Idlib. Uh, the Russians, let me, let me make sure I've got the story right. Uh, the headline story, uh, Idlib airstrikes uh, underscore wider region. Uh, there is a realization that uh, Idlib has been well... Fairly well, a lot of people dead, lots of people dead, major escalation between the Syrian government and, and the coalition against the Syrians there, uh, the Syrian government being led by the Russians. There is the Biden collapse. By the way, do you or a loved one you know have electile dysfunction? Their name may be Joe Biden. This guy, I mean, I saw the he, he, I, I saw the polling. I, I've said to you guys the entire time I've been on this program since August that the most remarkable statistic is that Joe Biden and the Real Clear Politics polling average has averaged around 28 percent and has never fallen. It has been consistent for 52 weeks. It has been consistent and no nominee for either party has ever lost after being 22 weeks consistently in the polls. Joe Biden has been 22 weeks consistently in the polls and look at him. I mean, it, he's limp in the polls. It, it is it is a downward dip. He needs some electoral Viagra to get back up in the polls, and it's not going to happen for him at this point, it looks like. Uh, there's North Korea. The North Koreans are so overwhelmed with the coronavirus, they're asking for American help. There's Reinhardt. Reinhardt was the one I had to Google and, and interrupt myself. Uh, I, I thought it must be Stephen Reinhardt. Stephen Reinhardt is a judge. Uh, Stephen Reinhardt is a, is a very popular progressive j federal judge. Uh, they love him. They absolutely love him. He uh, has a number of, of uh, prominent law clerks now out in the media. He's, I mean, he is a big deal. And now it turns out that uh, Judge Reinhardt uh, harassed uh, law clerks. There is AB5. That is the, the uh, ballot initiative in California that has caused freelancers to lose work. There's the Astros cheating scandal. Man, that press conference was terrible. Uh, gay marriage in Ireland and on and on it goes. And, and the media is fixated on this William Barr stuff. And, you know, it, it's the it's the Trumpian soap opera on which they are fixed. And they've all got opinions on it. Here's Susan Hennessy, not not the brightest star in the sky on CNN. Yeah, I can't believe I'm about to be more cynical than Jeffrey Tubin, but I don't buy this for a second. <laughs> Bill Barr is reportedly facing an internal revolt in the Justice Department, four prosecutors withdrawing from the case, one resigning from the department entirely. Reportedly, more resignations might be coming in the coming days. This is Bill Barr attempting to quell that revolt by making a big, splashy statement. And the reason I think we can say we can say that Bill Barr is not being genuine in this statement is because he's claiming that he was acting in good faith.
that in this one case in which the DOJ has a process for considering sentencing recommendations, that process isn't perfect, but it is designed to be apolitical. When that process produced a result that was unfavorable to one of the president's political cronies, and in only that case, and in no other case, Bill Barr intervened. Now, whether or not he saw the president's tweet or that was acting on the president's direct request or not, that is political interference. And so the idea that Bill Barr is expecting us to believe that this is just a bespoke concern about criminal justice reform, one sort of Trump crony at a time, it, it, it just defies, you know, it defies logic, it defies belief. And, and I really do believe that this is just about theater and attempting to hold the line with his own staff within the department. Blah! I, what about verbal diarrhea? Good Lord. Uh, he, here's the thing. He, William Barr, whether you like him or not, and there are a lot of you out there who don't like him, uh, who, who are upset with him for going after the president as he did on on TV with ABC News. There are a lot of you don't like him because you think you're co- he's covered for the president. The man is an institutionalist. He's been attorney general before. He was George H.W. Bush's attorney general. Uh, there was bipartisan policy. And, and here's the thing behind the scenes. I know enough of these people in Washington. Behind the scenes, Democrats and Republicans alike like William Barr. In public, the Democrats have to fundraise off the angst over William Barr. But behind the scenes, they actually like William Barr. And the reason they like William Barr is because they believe he's a steady hand. One of the things that William Barr knows is the president's temperament. So he obviously knew when a U.S. attorney comes to William Barr and says, hey, I think we're going to go seven and nine years on Roger Stone. And William Barr knows that no one similarly situated to Roger Stone has ever gone seven and nine years. He knows they got to do something. And the smartest way to do it is to put it on the judge, not the Department of Justice. Why? Because they got to maintain the good graces of the courts, but also they got to maintain the good graces of the president of the United States. William Barr is a master, uh, masterful player. And the U.S. attorney didn't listen, and Barr had to do what he did. And in doing what he did, the media said, oh, he's doing what Donald Trump wanted him to do. No, he's doing what he he needed to do to head off what Donald Trump did. Unfortunately, the U.S. attorney didn't listen. So now Barr has come out, and and you heard him on ABC News say, no, the president didn't talk to him. He did it because it was the right thing to do. He's not going to be bullied by anybody, including the president of the United States. But the president's tweets have made it impossible for him to do his job. You know, the the, the Department of Justice has to keep its integrity with the federal courts. If, if the, the Department of Justice can be bullied by the president into doing something the Department of Justice doesn't think is right, it causes all sorts of problems for the Department of Justice. What's so amazing here, though, is, is twofold. One, that... Members of the media are playing up the drama, and two, that a lot of them are saying, well, he doesn't really mean it. He's just playing to the crowd. How do you know? Those who are sure of themselves, like Susan Hennessy, who, again, she's not the brightest star in the sky when it comes to this. I mean, she is uh, Donald. She's in the list of people broken by Donald Trump. Everything Trump does is bad. Uh, if Donald Trump were to come out tomorrow and cure the planet of global warming, she would denounce him for putting a bunch of scientists out of work. William Barr did what he thought was right, and he shouldn't be denounced for doing what he thought was right, and yet the media plays up the soap opera and and misses so many other stories, and I don't want to be – I don't want to be in the same boat as the rest of the media on this. CNN's gone for three hours now on the William Barr stuff. I want to move on, but there is one angle we need to discuss here, and I want to play this Jeffrey Tubin clip about Andrew McCabe. Andrew McCabe continuing to be investigated by the Justice Department for whether or not he tried to undermine the president or leak inappropriately uh, FBI information. Trump repeatedly said that Comey deserved to be charged, according to their account. Can you, expletive, believe they didn't charge him? Trump said on the night of the decision, uh, those people said. So that that goes back to Trump's enemies list. Do you think, do you think he, the DOJ? Well, I mean, the, the, look... You can have grievances with James Comey. The idea that he committed a crime is absurd. The person in a really perilous condition right now is the CNN contributor Andrew McCabe, Andrew McCabe, who is under investigation from the U.S. Attorney's Office right now and you know, has had his case dangling out there. The president obviously wants Andy McCabe prosecuted, and 
it's it's just grotesque that you have the president of the United States behaving this way with the power the, 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 of prosecution. But what he's saying is, I mean, you brought in Andy McKay, but what he's saying is if if Flynn and Stone are going to go to jail or be in jail, shouldn't Comey and, as you say, McCabe, shouldn't... That's how he feels. But they did different things. I mean, I mean there's just... You know, the facts are not... In, the, the facts are not identical. So, I mean, it's just because he likes the two who were prosecuted and doesn't like the people who weren't prosecuted. That's not a reason. Okay, but that's exactly <laughs> why. That's, that's, the, you're that's exactly the Donald Trump's, I think, the danger of what he is trying to do to the Justice Department is he doesn't understand why he can't direct which people should be heading to jail and which shouldn't. He can't. Except he kind of can't. He is the president. As I said, the executive power of the presidency is is there. Now, Barr can resign. In fact, this was the whole thing with Nixon and, and um, the various people who tried to – he tried to fire – what's his name? The, the Watergate uh, prosecutor – and it couldn't get anybody to do it. it. It wound up being left to, I think, what, William Rehnquist or, or no, um, um, uh, Bork. Or was it Robert Bork? I can't remember. Anyway, um, and he, the people of the Department of Justice resigned out of principle. But Andrew McCabe does have problems. He, he does have real problems, and he is under investigation right now. But it, this is it's all drama. All of it. Is drama. You know, the other drama out there is Hope Hicks is returning to the White House. Uh, she's going to work for Jared Kushner. She's not going to work in the communications office. She left as the communications director of the White House. And now she come on. OK, I, I'm, I'm going on a tangent. We have State Farm insurance. And I love State Farm. We've always had State Farm. I loved our State Farm agent, Gene Soule, uh, was a wonderful man. Uh, his wife is a wonderful person. He was our State Farm agent, and he passed away. And State Farm has sent us to a new – well, they sent us to a State Farm agent who left us alone. And then somehow or another, we got transferred to another State Farm agent. And that guy's office is calling me all the time. And it's telemarketers calling, wanting to upsell me on stuff. Can't your insurance company leave you the hell alone unless you want them? I mean, I work 80 hours a week. I don't need the insurance company calling and say, hey, we could upsell you or rearrange your policy. Leave me alone. What do I do to get off the call list? Come on. Sorry. It's rather aggravating calling me now. Uh, and, and, you know, when, when it happened the first time, it was it was through a number that was labeled as a spam alert. I don't know if you're aware of this. This is a complete random aside set off by my rage over this. If Whether you have Google phone, Android devices or iPhones, you can get into your app store and your cell phone provider. I, I've got AT&T. You may have Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, whoever. Uh, they have an app in the app store. And it is a spam call alert system, and you can download it. Uh, you just put in your your provider, and you'll find the app. Uh, call Protect is usually what it's called, and it's it's branded for each of your your phones. Some of you may get it automatically from your carrier. And so, when a phone number calls that is a potential spam caller, you see the list, and it says spam alert. Do not answer. So the other day that happened to me, I'm driving down the road and I see this and it says spam alert, do not answer the number. It's always from Cochrane, Georgia for me. I don't understand why all the numbers come out of Cochrane, Georgia, but all, every single time it's one of those spam alert calls, it's from Cochrane, Georgia. They call the house, uh, they call my cell phone, and it always says it's a caller from Cochrane, Georgia. I, 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 there are not a bunch of robo dialers from Cochrane, Georgia. I don't understand why, but nonetheless, I digress. Uh, so you go in and you get this thing, and when they call, because you have this app running, in your phone, it says, hey, this may be a spam caller. Don't answer it. Well, this happened to me the other day, and it was a spam caller, and so I hung up, and they called right back, and they called right back, and I thought, well, I guess this actually is someone legit. It's not a robo-dialer, and I put it on, and by God, it's someone from that guy. I don't want to give his name out. Uh, he's here local. I don't want to shame the guy, and, and he, he may not even know what's happening, but it may just be State Farm doing it, but State Farm calls, and hey, yeah, I'm calling from so-and-so's office, and they want to update um, they, they, they want to update your policies and they want you to come in for a review and they may be able to, to get you more insurance and check your, I don't need it. That's what I have Chris Burns for. I, I use Chris Burns. He's my financial. He's like a primary care physician. He looks at all my different stuff, finances, insurance, investments, says, Hey, you should up this given your income. You need more protection. If you're in a car wreck or your, or your home needs this, that's what I use him for this hour sponsored by dynamic money. Not really, but yeah, you get the point. I'm just come on people. What is with this? 
Stop bothering all of us, you telemarketers for these companies. You know, there's there's a there's a exception in the spam call rule. If you have an ongoing business relationship with a company, they can get around the spam calling, the telemarketer rules. And so your insurance company can call you out of the blue and say, hey, we want to upsell you or, on something or reprioritize it. Stop it. Just stop it. It makes me not want to do business with you, State Farm. I am tired of these phone calls. I called them the other day and said, take them off the list. And by God, they're calling me while I'm on the radio show. Yes, this is Doug the dog. A friend of mine texted me and said, tangent, way, way tangent, squirrel. Yes, it is. But it makes me so mad. It drives me up the wall. Look, I, I, I understand the normal telemarketer calling. It's crazy. We have a landline at our house. The reason we have a landline at our house is because uh, I do a lot of radio interviews around the country and a landline quality. For some reason, we've traded the convenience of a good quality uh, conversation for a cell phone. I get the convenience of a cell phone, but your standard cell phone phone quality is crap compared to a landline. So for radio interviews, I use a landline and everyone appreciates it. And I use do a lot of radio interviews because they say, hey, this guy has a landline. We get so many calls on our home phone. We, we hardly get calls. I don't know. I, if I didn't do so many radio interviews, I wouldn't keep the landline anymore because all we seem to get are telemarketer calls. And it's crazy. And it's annoying. And I don't have a business relationship with any of them. So it's like the Police Benevolence Association. God bless you, police officers. But I'm never giving a penny to the Police Benevolence Association because they won't leave me alone. I wouldn't anyway. I'd rather support other charities that help police officers. But nonetheless, when you've got a business relationship with a company like your insurance company and they want to call you, you know, the cable company doesn't call and try to upsell me packages or get me to be on HBO. I don't know why the insurance company decides to do that. And it's not just the insurance company anymore. It's all sorts of companies doing it. They need to get rid of that little exception in the in the law for companies you have a pre-existing relationship with. I will call them if I want to change to my insurance. I don't need State Farm call and bothering me i will get off my my distracted tirade we will move on to other things man all the stuff i was going to talk about this hour and and it all got i haven't even gotten to bernie sanders yet we spent so much time on on poor old saint valentine being beheaded and in hallmark making money off his dead body and and william barr i haven't even gotten to it but i i gotta i gotta mention colin kaepernick Got it. Got to mention him. Colin Kaepernick. He's self-publishing. He's creating a publishing company, and Kaepernick is going to. Uh, he, he's gonna publish his book, and it's going to be all social justice and and what he's still doing for the cause. Is he still relevant? It, it, you know, the media try uh, talk about overplaying your hand. This is this is one of the problems. Uh, with with current uh, quasi celebrity status, uh, with with woke celebrity status, I should say, because he, he isn't a quasi celebrity; he is a celebrity, uh, but he is largely right now a celebrity because of woke politics. Uh, kneeling, taking taking a knee during the the um, during the anthem, and at first he said it was about po- the police brutality. He wanted to highlight police brutality, but his reasoning morphed over time from the injustices of colonialism and imperialism of this country and all that hoo-ha. And now he's out there saying he's going to uh, publish his book. Does it matter? You know, he came to Atlanta. He was going to do that thing at the Falcons facility up in Gainesville or Flowery Branch, wherever it is. And then at the very last minute, 30 minutes before he was supposed to show up, all of the teams were there. The scouts were there. They were ready to go. But it wasn't going to be televised. It wasn't going to be videotaped. It was just going to be for them. And he decided, no, someone convinced him, hey, do it at a local high school football field in Riverdale, Georgia, and live stream it so those who wanted could watch. And he invited the media. All the media showed up, but none of the scouts showed up. And he wasn't super impressive. Uh, the guy who was helping him was apparently super impressive and got an offer from a football team. But but Kaepernick was not. And then, of course, they they tried to blame the NFL teams. That's not the way you do it if you want to get a job with an NFL team. You don't screw up their schedules and then throw them under the bus. That's not the way it works. He sounds like such a pleasant guy. Sounds so pleasant. Um, Sounds like he couldn't cut it and he's decided to capitalize on wokeness. Um, And I'm sure there's someone who's like, you couldn't do what he did. No, I, I, I don't pretend to be an NFL quarterback. I barely understand the game. I grew up in Dubai. I can explain camel racing and cricket to you. Um, it, but yeah, Kaepernick, I mean, and, and then poor Garoppolo, just they blew it with the Super Bowl. But, hey, I was rooting for Kansas City anyway. Nonetheless, 
Uh, Kaepernick, he, he seems like every couple of months now, he's got to come up with some way to stay in the spotlight. He's got to find a way to stay in the spotlight. And the media eats it up because of his woke politics. But even the media seems to be getting tired of his nonsense. The fact that he's decided to create a publishing company to publish his memoir, I wonder if he's lobbying to get the publishing rights for Das Kapital or something. It wouldn't surprise me or, or something else from Karl Marx. We'll see. When we come back, let's talk about an exploding star. Just a quick time out from the show to thank one of my favorite sponsors, one of the products I use on a daily basis multiple times. That would be my Quip electric toothbrush. And I really am a customer, and I really was before they started advertising for me. That's the way I like to do these ads. I like to endorse a product I'm already using, and Quip is one that I use, my wife uses, and both of my kids use, and we've used it before I started advertising. They make great electric toothbrushes. They're not the super fancy expensive ones, and you get a better clean. Why do you get a better clean? Well, because the quip you brush your teeth for two minutes and it pulses every 30 seconds so you know how to reposition it in your mouth and for those two minutes dennis wants you to brush your teeth for two minutes you get a great clean with great sonic vibrations that really get your teeth clean and you know i've got invisalign braces so i've got those attachments a lot of stuff gets stuck in them and behind the little attachments and with the quip i can always clean my teeth the way they need to be clean it is a great toothbrush and it's not going to break the bank it's just well made you can tell it's made by dennis and designers together if you go to getquip.com slash erickson right now you can get a quip and you can start with a brush head refill subscription where every three months they send you a new brush head they even include a battery and you get your first refill for free that's your first refill free at getquip.com slash erickson it's g-e-t-q-u-i-p.com slash erickson e-r-i-c-k-s-o-n quip the good habits company it is eric erickson here the eric erickson show across the state of georgia welcome the second hour the phone number you want to be a part of the program 877-97-ERIC 877-973-7425 you know i never do this but it's friday we'll say it's an an honor of rush and do an open line friday sort of thing Uh, and I'll, i'll go go out of the gate to to a phone call when i normally don't uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to screw up your name, aren't I? Is, is it Javi? How do you pronounce your first name? Uh, Javi. I, I got it right. Excellent. Welcome. Hey, <clears throat> glad to be part of the show. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Uh, me and my pastor, we were just discussing about the climate of the United States with politics and everything that's going on in society. And we're just wondering, you know, where does, you know, Christians come into play as far as getting into the political arena and you me, you know, I'm 23 years old, I'm a Hispanic, you know, conservative Christian, married, been married for three years and uh, just w- wondering where do you where do you even begin uh, and, you know, just to try to make a change in your local area and, you know, obviously Oh man, or- that, that is such a great question. Uh, Javi, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, now I'm, I'm going to go on and I, I will, I'll let you get off the phone here so you can listen on WGAU in Athens, uh, where you are. Uh, that's our flagship station anyway. Um, how do you, as a young Christian uh, who's conservative, uh, Hispanic get involved in politics? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm glad. You, and by the way, if y'all want to call in eight seven seven nine seven three seven four two five nine seven three seven four two five is the phone number. Um, I am a big, big, big. In fact, I, I, I. I <laughs> so I'm giving a speech in a couple of weeks in Colorado, and a friend of mine who organized the speech sent me a note and said, by the way, they've heard your Jeremiah, Jeremiah spiel before. Ouch. Uh, I am beginning to sound like a broken record on it, but but I am a, a big believer in it. In fact, uh, I, I've, I leave out key words, so I'm going to, it is my favorite passage in the Bible. If someone were to ask me, I would say it is Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you were to ask me my second favorite passage in the Bible, it would be Jeremiah 29, 7. Uh, I am a, a huge proponent of this. In fact, I met some people recently who founded a, a nonprofit called uh, called uh, Jer- Jeremiah 29. 
Let me let me read you the fuller passage for context here. This is your theology moment of the day, I guess. I had something I was going to talk about that is somewhat theology, but but uh, to Javi's point, th- this is actually a great question. question is, how do I, as a young uh, conservative Christian, get involved in politics, particularly the way the country is right now? Uh, frankly, I mean, it, it seems like you're going to lose your soul in politics these days for tribalism, and you shouldn't. Uh, I, I try to try to thread the needle sometimes uh, better than other times on this show, calling out right and wrong on both sides. But let me read this fuller passage to you, and we'll focus on the, the key phrase here. We'll have we'll have Sermon Friday. How about that? These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King uh, Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the middle workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Saphon, and uh, Gemara, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, this is this, these are the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Pretty powerful stuff. Now notice this is this is Jeremiah um, is saying it's not Nebuchadnezzar who sent you into exile. It is God Himself who sent you into exile. Uh, and and what what is his advice? His advice is to build a house, plant a garden, get married, have kids, have big families, to establish yourself in the city in which you're in exile. And and then this this is Jeremiah seven. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Now, to have you who called in, who's listening in Athens, that, that doesn't mean the United States for you. Doesn't mean the United States for any single person listening to this program today. You know, words mean things, and, and words in the Bible mean things. I have an awesome program where I can uh, run my my uh, cursor over the word, and it tells me in, in Hebrew as it was written, what does it mean? And, and the word uh, city used by Jeremiah uh, does not mean nation. It does not mean empire. It it actually means city, uh, no greater than province. So so no greater than state, in other words, in our situation, um, it does does not mean empire, does not mean nation, does not mean the United States of America. It means for Javi, who called Athens, Georgia. If you're listing in Rome, it means Rome. If you're listing in Dalton, it means Dalton. If you're listing in Brunswick, it means Brunswick. If you're listing in Macon, it means Macon. If you're listing in Columbus, it means Columbus. You got me? You got me. Seek the welfare of the city in which you are in exile and pray for it, and there you will find your welfare. How many of you pray for your city? The Bible says to pray for your uh, to pray for your leaders. It says to pray for your your uh, officials. Uh, pray for the emperor. Pray for the king. Pray for the president. Pray for the vice president. Pray for the cabinet. Pray for Nancy Pelosi. But pray for your city. How many of you are praying for Athens, Georgia, who are listening in Athens, or Clarksville, who are listening in Clarksville? But more than that, it means don't obsess about the nation. Obsess about your local community. We as a, as conservatives, we tend to get fixated and worked up on this idea of uh, Washington is going to change things. We need to control Washington. The left certainly is. The, the, the left has, has traded religion for politics. Politics has become their religion, and controlling Washington controls the church of state. But you as a Christian are, are called to be different from the rest of the world. You, you, if you're a person of faith, you're not to be like the world. You're to be like a Christian. You're to be like the exiles. You're to seek the welfare of your local community. So now, how does this translate into politics? Well, 
I'm not saying don't run for Congress. I'm not saying don't run for president. I'm not saying don't run for the Senate. But what I am saying is how many of you show up at your local school board? How many go to a school board meeting? How many pray for your local school board member? How many of you go to your city council or your county commission meeting? How many of you have thought about running locally? See, when a lot of people think about running, they think I'm going to run for Congress or I'm going to run for the state house. I'm, I'm going to run for the state Senate. How about your local school board? You know, your local school board will affect the people of your community vastly more than the state legislature will affect your local community. Your local school board will affect your local community vastly more than the United States Congress or the President of the United States or the Department of Health and Human Services will affect your local community. Seek the welfare of the city in which you're in exile, and there you'll find your welfare. You want to get involved in politics, run for national office if you want to run for national office, but consider running for school board. Consider running for city council. Consider running for a local position. Consider volunteering volunteering. Consider having your church, instead of sending kids off to Acapulco to hammer nails and work on suntans, to go out into the local community and pick up trash, to go into the inner city and help repair roofs and put paint on on houses and mow the grass for the poor people in the local community. Consider having your church uh, raise money to pay off the medical bills of people in your community, not just the people in the church, but the people in the community. You know the things that set Christians apart in the Roman Empire and that made them persecuted? There were a number of factors, but one of the factors was that the local Christian community wasn't just about taking care of the local Christian community. The local Christian community in the Roman Empire would try to take care of other people, would go to the fa- go to the town dump and rescue the children. You know what a, an abortion really was, an, an abori really was, where the word abortion comes from? They, they would leave the children in the town dump. They would give birth. The women would give birth. They would decide it's a girl. We don't want the girl. We're going to go drop it off in the town dump, and there it would die. And the Christians were considered weird because they would go get the kids left in the town dump and raise them as their own. In addition to having their own kids, they would have large families, some of whom weren't their natural children because they were rescuing those children. The culture of life is pervasive within Christianity, and they stood out by doing stuff like that. The Christians stood out by being the people who, when there was a plague in the Roman Empire, they would go towards the plague, not run away from the plague, to help other people and some of them would die. Much like you see that the the major American uh, health care workers who go to e- e- help with Ebola in Africa, or probably now the coronavirus in China, but particularly the Ebola in Africa, they're Christian missionary doctors. They go where angels fear to tread. They, they, they go in, in Jesus's name to, to help other people. But all you got to do is go into your backyard, seek the welfare of the city in which you're in exile, and there you'll find your welfare. You are in exile. You're a pilgrim traveling through this world headed home to eternity. And, and you fixate on Washington, D.C. at your peril. That's one reason I try to weave in local stories. I, I, I don't want to always be a Georgia show. I really would like a national show. And, and I've got to fixate and convince myself and convict myself that there are stories nationally or there are stories locally around the country that I can raise to a national profile, but also uh, to encourage the people in those local communities. you got to you got to worry about your local community. Worry about your local school board. Do you know up in Bartow County, uh, Bruce Thompson is the state senator up in Bartow County, and he every Christmas, I've mentioned this before, he gets all the local pastors from all of the churches in Bartow County to come to his house for dinner. You've got Mormon, Methodist, Jewish, Catholic, Orthodox, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, Presbyterian, you name it. They're all under his roof together at one time, seeing each other face to face, vastly different theologies from each other, but all with the exception of the Jewish rabbi, all of them uh, work in the name of Jesus. And do you know what those churches have done since they've been getting together at his house, all of them with skeptical, different theologies? Some of them looking at the others thinking you're not a church, you're a cult. Some of them looking at others thinking you're going to hell. Some of them looking at others thinking you're denying people uh, access to Mary. You, you, it, it doesn't matter. They all come under his roof, and in, in, in the name of their Lord that they believe in, they seek the welfare of the community in which they live. And you've got these churches now in Bartow County coordinate with each other on volunteers to go into local local uh, schools. Schools And so every local school in every local classroom has a volunteer from a church who is in there helping the teachers in those classrooms. And the literacy rate is up. The math rates are up. And it's local churches seeking the welfare of the cities in which they are in exile because they know they'll find their welfare. If you're a Christian in politics in the United States today, it is a crazy time to be in politics because everybody wants you to be a brain biblical donkey for your side. 
And there are a lot of things that this president does that if you're a Christian, you, you can't applaud. And it's horrifying to see some Christians do it. But you know it. Deep down, you know it. Don't get mad at me for saying it. You know it. There are things. This president has cheated on multiple wives, including his current wife, cheated on her with a porn star while she was pregnant. And you can deny that all you want, but we know it's true. There's documentation that it's true. It's inappropriate, and people should not applaud that. They should call on him to repent. And half the Christians in Washington, D.C. are so transactional with this president, they're perfectly happy for him to go to hell so long as they get good policy at him while he's here. Uh, they have put the president's soul in jeopardy by never calling for him to repent and sharing authentically the gospel because they're so busy getting the scraps from his table. And that's unfortunate. And, and that's being a bad Christian, frankly. But also these people have invested so much emotional energy in Washington, D.C. They haven't taken care of the widows, the orphans, the poor, and the refugees in their own community. And that's what you're called to do. Seek the welfare of the community in which you're in exile, and there you'll find your welfare. Avi, if you're still listening in Athens and in any of you around the state or the nation who are listening, be involved in your local community. Doesn't mean you got to run for office. But, you know, contra Cain, you're you are your brother's keeper. And your brother is your next door neighbor. Is the homeless man down the street, the guy on the park bench looking lost, the Alzheimer's patient lost wandering the street looking for his way home, seek the welfare of the city in which you're in exile. That's where you're going to find your welfare. And when the great persecution finally comes, it'll be the people in your community who have your back, not the abstract values of Washington, D.C., because the people of your community saw you having their back when you didn't have to do it. All righty. It is Eric Erickson. The phone number 877-973-7425. Scott calling from Marietta. Welcome. Hey, yeah, it's crazy that Virginia wants to give up what the founding fathers fought hard to have for just to offset the largest states grueling the other smaller ones. It's just to me like textbooks in schools and that New California, Texas, New York, all the other states have to use the textbooks that they want. I mean, you know, yeah, Hillary had the popular vote and everything else, but uh, how much did they really campaign in California trying to get the Republicans out of there? Yeah, so yeah you know, so I, vote I, I got to tell you, I think that uh, I, the, the national popular vote thing, it's, it's kind of a scam. Um, thank you very much for the phone call, Scott. Uh, the if What Scott's talking about is Virginia has passed a law that will give the popular vote of the, or will give its electoral college to whoever wins the popular vote nationally. This is the thing Democrats have been pushing since uh, Donald Trump won the election. Um, but there's a catch. If you actually read the fine print, it's a state compact and a state compact has to be approved by Congress, which it hasn't been done. But more importantly, under the plain text of the legislation passed in Virginia that would award its electoral college delegates to the winner of the national popular vote, uh, it won't go into effect until 200, until enough states equal to 270 electoral college votes have signed on to it. And that's not going to happen uh, because you can't, with all the, the states controlled by Democrats, you still can't get to 270. So it's going to be a while. And some of those states have walked it back. A couple of the states that passed it uh, then got Republican Republicans elected and walked it back. Here's the thing. Uh, if Donald Trump in 2020 wins the popular vote, you will see a bunch of these states abandon their effort and rebuild the law. I think it would be hilarious if the president uh, won the popular vote and then immediately filed a lawsuit against Virginia. Now, uh, the lawsuit would be timely because, again, the fine print of the law says it's got to be – you can't do it until enough states to get to, uh, to 270 electoral college have done it. But it would still be hilarious, and it would be hilarious because it would highlight how foolish these efforts are. You know, back in the, the mid-2000s, uh, in, in 2010 period or so – uh, 2010. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. It was after, after, after I got, was on race. So it would have been 2014, 2014, a prominent member of our state Senate here in Georgia came to me and said, what do you think about the national popular vote? I said, it, it, it's nuts. It's a terrible idea. Uh, what you're essentially saying is that if Georgia's voters vote for a Republican, uh, Georgia's Electoral College is going to have to give them a middle finger and vote for the Democrat. And he's like, well, uh, uh, it got the lobbyists down here from, from from the national popular vote, folks, and and they're making a lot of sense on that argument. It wouldn't happen until you got to 270 and, you know, majority rules and we're democracy. I'm like, no, no, John, it's a bad idea. 
And he was ultimately persuaded it was a bad idea. But the lobbyist is now a huge Donald Trump guy. And what, what's so hilarious about it is the, the particular lobbyist from up north who, who was coming down here trying to lobby the legislature on it uh, is now an opponent of it. Now that, that the president won but lost the popular vote. And Democrats, the moment a Democrat wins but loses the popular vote, the those legislator, legislatures that pass this will immediately repeal it. Uh, this is all a dog and pony show, and it's not actually going to go anywhere. I wouldn't get too worked up about it, honestly, uh, because you got to wait until you get to 270. And, and when you look at the number of states out there to get to 270, they've either got split legislatures or they're run by Republicans, so it's probably not going to happen. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-973-7425, 877-97-ERIC. Uh, you can also text the word RECIPE. To 33777. Now, I know I've been bad about this, but I promise the weekend is upon us. I will find a recipe. I don't know what it is, but I will send you a recipe. It's going to be cold, so maybe something for I may have to send out my baked potato soup recipe. It's actually my wife's baked potato soup recipe, um, but I will, I will get you a recipe uh, for cold weather. And I suppose in, in North Georgia, there are reports that there may be snow flurries this week. It's crazy. Our weather cannot make up its mind. It's got schizophrenia. Now, when we come back, I actually had something I wanted to talk about this hour, uh, and I want to talk about Beetlejuice, not not the movie Beetlejuice, 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 Beetlejuice. No, I actually want to talk about the star, and then I actually want to talk to you about a Baptist church. I, I did not mean for today to be Theology Day. I, I really did not mean for today to be Theology Day, uh, but there is a Baptist church uh, in North Georgia. Well, it, it's, it's in Decatur. I shouldn't say North Georgia. It's in Decatur, and it's run to the media to cry. And at least that's my impression of the story. I could be wrong about that, but it seems like that they've run to the media to cry. And I want to discuss this with you, this issue, when we come back. There is other stuff we got to talk about as well, including this bizarre New Yorker piece on why Pete Buttigieg apparently is not gay enough for gay voters. It's it's crazy. I want to explain it, though, when we come back right here on the Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia. It is Eric Erickson here. Sorry, having to respond to an urgent message. I want to talk about an exploding star because uh, if if you happen to drive through Macon uh, occasionally uh, when it's dark at night and there's no moon in the sky, you wouldn't be able to see me because it is so dark um, that we are uh, we are waiting for Beetlejuice to explode. Now, if you if you up oh, up. Oh, oh. Uh, what is this? Oh, nice. Oh, n- uh, if you know the constellation Orion, then you know that in the the top left of the constellation Orion, there is a very bright reddish star, and it is called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is expected to it is a super giant star and it is expected to go supernova it is expected to explode and scientists say <laughs> scientists scientists say a lot of things but in this case i suspect they're right scientists say that when beetlejuice explodes you'll be able to see it during the day sorry i had to cut my mic had to cough um you, you'll be able to see it during the day It'll be the brightest object in the sky besides the sun. That's how bright it's expected to be, even though it is far, far away from us. It may have already exploded, but, you know, uh, the way light travels, we couldn't see it. Now, it's got less than 100,000 years left, and so Jesus may come back and, and, and sort the heavens and the earth before Betelgeuse explodes, but... It's been dimming and increasingly dimming, and it goes through a cycle of dimming and brightening, and it is dimming outside the normal parameters of its cycle, which suggests that something rapidly is happening. And there are a ton of people who every night are staring at the fainting of Betelgeuse and expecting to have it explode. Now, there are some spoil sports scientists who would tell us that there could actually just be a dust cloud in front of the star right now, and that's why it's dimming so much more rapidly. There could be something we can't see in front of between us and it, and we're waiting to to see it explode. But um, just a few months ago, it was two and a half times brighter than it is right now. It's the tenth brightest star in the sky. 
Over the past few months, it's dimmed so dramatically. It's now ranked the 24th brightest star in the sky, and it has astronomers wondering if it really is about to explode. Uh, This is from CNET. Uh, Put it to you this way. The change in scale means that Betelgeuse was two and a half times brighter in September than it is right now. The most recent photometric observations indicate Betelgeuse is currently the least luminous and coolest it has been um, in 25 years of studying it. It's nearing the end of its life. It's expected to go supernova in the next 100,000 years. It's first going to shrink and collapse in on itself and then rebound in a remarkable explosion that could be brighter than the moon and visible during daylight it's possible we're starting to see the end of the death throes now but it could be something else they say i'm just fascinated by this one reason is because if you have a camera you don't need in fact i believe you may be able to do this with your iphone if you can use one of those manual apps to keep the shutter open you can actually see the Orion's Nebula. If you look around Orion's Belt, and I, I've taken some beautiful pictures of this. You can find them. You should follow me on Instagram. It's where you'll like me the most, uh, E.W. Erickson. I'm E.W. Erickson on Twitter, on Instagram, everywhere. Uh, but on Instagram, I, I've got pictures that I've taken uh, with my telescope of uh, of Orion's Nebula, and it is uh, beautiful colors. Beautiful, beautiful colors. There are reds and there are pinks and there are oranges and yellows and purples and blues and greens. It's just, it's gorgeous. And it is massively far away and it is a massive size. And you can actually see it if you take just a regular camera. Now, I realize everybody has their iPhones these days. They don't actually have cameras. But if you have a camera and you can leave the shutter open, you can point your camera at Orion's belt and leave your shutter open for about seven seconds. Maybe you don't even really need to do seven. You could do five seconds, and you will be able to take a picture of Orion's Nebula. You'll be able to see it with your camera. It's Now, the reason you got to leave your, your shutter open is because the shutter feeds the light in. And if you stare long enough, if you want to look up in the night sky and there's no moon around and no lights, if you stare long enough at Orion's Nebula, you can see it. You can't see it great, but you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to see the fuzziness just below uh, the the left star on the outer star of the belt, the, the left outer star of the belt. You'll be able to see Orion's Nebula. It's really cool to see. And that's one one of the downsides of living in, in urban and suburban areas is the city lights. I would love, I would kill one day to have a farm. There's actually some land out, out in Monroe County, uh, just north of where I live in, in Bibb County, there's some land. It's several hundred acres. There are no street lights around, and I would kill to have the money to buy that land and build a house and have no street lights around. And sure, it, it wouldn't be as dark as I would prefer, but it would be darker than where I live. And man, I could have my telescope outside at night and take pictures. It's just I, I'm fascinated by it. But uh, you, you, you should be. I realize if you're not a science nerd or you pay no attention to this, you should. Because it's a phenomenal thing that this star is about to explode. And yes, uh, we got a, maybe 100,000 years. But there's a growing body of scientists out there who think it could happen any moment now. The star could explode. Uh, the, the, the sun could go down tonight and Orion rise of the sky and us realize that, wow, it has exploded. Um, of course, people on the other side of the planet would see it. We, we have no idea. But I'm excited by the prospect. Now. We got to move on to other non-nerdy news. Um, I did not intend for today to be the theology show, but I want to. I want to read you the story because I got thoughts. I, I got comments, and this is happening in a lot of parts of the state. This is from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. The Atlanta Metro Baptist Association, which I didn't even know existed, uh, has severed ties with the First Baptist Church of Decatur over what it calls a misalignment of biblical standards. First Baptist's senior pastor, David Jordan, thinks it boils down to the fact that the church has ordained gay deacons and is an LGBTQ inclusive congregation at a time the association has taken a quote unquote pretty hard right turn. Pastor Jordan says, I don't think anybody likes to be kicked out of anything, but in a way we can feel good about it because we are being kicked out for a very worthy cause. It is sad that people have this kind of mindset. The Claremont Road Church was notified of the action in a January 31st letter from the Atlanta Baptist 
Association, Atlanta Metro Baptist Association Executive Director Jimmy Bogum. The letter does not mention the LGBTQ issue. Uh, it says the church's misalignment with the qualifications of a member church by affirming, approving, or endorsing practices or behaviors that do not align with biblical standards, as outlined in the manual procedure adopted by the association in May 2019. I, I, I've, I mean, it seems pretty clear from reading the story that it is the church that went to the media with the story. And this is one of those churches that's opposed to religious liberty legislations, et cetera. Y'all, here's why I bring this up. It's not really a theological point. We're, we're seeing this happen more and more in this country on so many issues. But on the church issue, it, it really does mean something. Um, how many people are rewriting God in their own image? You know, we, we've got in making the First Baptist Church here has done the same thing. That's now the First Baptist Church in Christ, uh, allowing gay marriage and, and whatnot in the church. You know, it, Words actually mean things, and the Bible actually means things, and the reality is that uh, it is, you know, what's his name, Josh Harris? Uh, is that him who who left the faith? He wrote the book on, on courtship, and he, I think, has decided to come out as gay. And now he's divorced his wife, and, and he said he's got to leave the Christian faith because the Christian faith is not compatible uh, with the way he sees the world now. And at least he's honest about it. And that's what kind of makes me mad, honestly, is the people who can't be honest about their faith. that They, they want to be—you know, I, I could come out tomorrow and say that I'm Zoroastrian, and it doesn't make it so. And believe it or not— there are issues and values that that separate Christianity from the rest of the world. A Christianity that looks just like the world isn't actually Christianity because the things of the world are opposed to the things of God. And increasingly now we've got churches that bring in the, the big bands and the big celebration parties and they got the big hair band celebration and we got to bring people in and we got to get them excited about Jesus. What about the Holy Spirit? Um, and again, I, I don't mean to make this the, theological, but somebody needs to say it, and I guess I'm the one who's got to say it. Um, the, the scripture is very clear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, you can learn a lot about that very first line in the Bible. That's why I say it's my favorite line in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you know, in, in, the, the, actual, in the actual Hebrew, it's actually f fantastic in the way it's constructed. It is, it, it, the Bible is really fantastic fixated on seven days and in the seventh day rest and in the original that that line of the bible in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth is seven words and the seven word is is and and the middle word is et uh and that word we don't really have it in english english but it it is the the focus of objects uh god created the heavens and the earth and it, it really, it was poetic in the way it was structured. And you just can't get that in the English language. Um, but it means something. And Genesis 1 means something. It got, how did God create the heavens and the earth? He, he put it in an order and he established an order. And one of the orders he established is that he made man, uh, male and female. And then he said, man can't be alone. That's why he creates female and he puts them together in marriage. And Jesus in the New Testament says that marriage is between a man and a woman. He he echoes the Old Testament faith. And then you've got Paul who comes along and says that adultery and, and drunkenness and homosexuality and other things are sin. And now we've got a modern church that wants to open the doors to everyone, uh, and there's no difference between them and the rest of the world. And many of these churches that have abandoned uh, biblical ethics are also the churches that are okay with abortion, or at least keep their mouth shut because they're aligned with the world on these issues. They're not aligned with God on these issues, and the media is very sympathetic to them. You will never see the media write a story praising Christianity for actually adhering to the standards of its faith, unless the standards of the faith are things that the, the world praises right now, like taking care of refugees because the president apparently is bad on those issues. If you find a church that literally is willing to stand up for the refugees out there, then they're heroes. But if you find a church that's actually in favor of abortion rights, man, the media, they will celebrate them. You find a church that's willing to affirm gay marriage, well, by God, they are the heroes of the faith, according to the media. There's just a problem. Under the clear, plain text of the Bible, that's not true. Now, there are people out there who believe, well, you know, this can't be the be-all, end-all of the faith. It, it, the Bible's got to got to evolve. Except 
Jesus is supposed to be the final word. He, he's not still speaking. He's given us scripture, and we're to learn about him from scripture. And, and to the extent he speaks to us in our hearts, to the extent that uh, our hearts deviate from what scripture says, it can't be. I mean, this this is kind of Christianity 101. I don't blame this church for, for wanting to run to the media and, and get some get some praise from the media, but let, let's be clear what's happening here is is they're getting worldly praise and they're not adhering to the faith standards of the Christian faith, and they can call themselves Christian all they want, but at some point you got to wonder, are they really? And now there are some of you out there who are saying right now, the Bible says don't judge, the Bible says actually, no, you know, Jesus did say judge. You, you got to take it in all contexts. And in fact, in the passage, everybody likes to to, to uh, quote as "Judge not, lest ye be judged." You know what he immediately says? He says, "Don't don't throw pearls before swine." That's a judgment call as to who the swine are. You you do have to judge to make up your mind. It's it's just it's infuriating to me that we live in a day and age where people so conveniently rewrite everything. And this goes full circle. It goes into into the discussion with William Barr and the president and whether or not the president can tell his attorney general what to do. As I said, the Constitution says that the executive power is invested in a single president of the United States. All power of the executive is derived from the president of the United States through the executive branch. The attorney general is one of the executive departments. He is of the executive branch. He is subordinate to the president. His power is derived from the president. So if the president withholds power or gives power to the attorney general, that's on him. The president's allowed to. And you can muddy the waters and say the attorney general is actually the attorney general of the United States and not of the president. And that may be so, but he's also a cabinet head. And as a cabinet head, He's subservient to the president. All of his power comes from the president. And if the president tells him what to do, he's got to do what the president says, whether you like it or not. It's called the unitary executive, and it's real. It's in the Constitution. It's the very first sentence of Article 2. In the same way, when Scripture says certain things, you've got to adhere to those things if you want to be called a Christian. I mean, you know, here's the thing. I, I get this from people on the left all the time. All the Bible says is you got to love Jesus. He's your Lord and Savior, and that's fine, but who's your Jesus? Because, you know, um, Albert Schweitzer, he was a, a, Albert Schweitzer was a genius. He, he won a Nobel Prize. He was a doctor. He was a philosopher. Uh, and, and he wrote a book on uh, the, the, the historic quest for the real Jesus. And he went through all of these philosophers who for years have been trying to find who the real Jesus was. By the way, it is mainstream that, that the man Jesus, let's take the divinity out of it, the man Jesus was actually real. And so Schweitzer documented all the people who've been trying to find the real Jesus, and he, he made a profound realization that all of the people who had been trying to find the real Jesus found someone who looked exactly like them. And so then what did Schweitzer do? He found a Jesus who is exactly like him. Everybody wants Jesus to be exactly like them. Uh, the, the people who are are open to affirming things the Bible condemns, well, you know, Jesus, he just wants to hug it out and love everyone. Uh, pay no attention to the Jesus who beat up the money changers. Uh, the, the the people who don't like it at all, that they want to focus on on the Jesus who beat up the money changers and, and threw the heretics out. You, I, I have discovered over the years that, that being a Christian is like, like walking a tightrope, uh, and it's very hard to stay on. You drift too far one way or the other, you wind up falling off. You get into too much legalese and it, or too much grace. Thankfully, we're all sinners. We all fall short, and he can put us back on the type rope and keep us walking. Uh, but it's just, it's frustrating to me that in the 20, 20, late 20th and now the early 21st century, uh, you pick the topic, not just faith. I, I use faith as the starting ground here, but on the Constitution, on faith, on life, on society itself. you got a bunch of people who decide that they're going to rewrite what words mean, and they're going to choose to redact the things they don't like. If I give someone the Bible and say, give them just the New Testament, forget the Old Testament, just give them the New Testament, and say, uh, redact. If there's a portion of Scripture you cannot preach from, then you're doing your faith wrong. And for a lot of these people, there are portions of Scripture they can't they can't preach from. You know, you give me the Bible, I, I preach on occasion. I've been in seminary. I've been working on my, my Ph.D. in theology. There's not a single passage of Scripture in the Bible I couldn't preach from. But for a lot of these, these progressive Christians, there are parts of the Bible they flat out can't preach from without saying it doesn't mean what it says. No, it all means what it says. You just don't like it. And you're using the media, the things of this world, to beat up the people of God who actually want to adhere to every page of Scripture. What about Leviticus? What about Leviticus? The people who say that don't actually understand what they're talking about.
It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. All right, it is official, the baked potato soup recipe. It's got We got cold weather for the weekend, so the baked potato soup recipe will go out. Uh, it's got a pound of bacon in it. It is glorious. It is so unhealthy, and it is so delicious, and I haven't made it this year because it's been so warm, but I am going to make it. Uh, if you want to if you want to copy the recipe, text the word recipe to 33777, really straightforward. The phone number you enter is 33777, and then you just send the word recipe. You will get an email or you'll get a text message back saying what's your email address. And you send your email address and it auto subscribes you to the email list and sometime around 12:30 you will get an email from me with the baked potato soup recipe, and it is glorious. So my wife loves baked potato soup. Uh, she had it for the first time. She was in Amelia Island with a friend of hers and went to a restaurant. It sounded good. She had it, and she liked it, but she thought she could do better, and she she really dove in head first to trying to recreate the recipe but also improving it, and, man, did she hit the nail on the head. It is a fantastic recipe. It is delicious. Uh, it's got basically a pound of cheese and a pound of bacon in it, so it is not exactly a healthy recipe. But when it is cold outside and you need something filling, it is incredible. So text the word recipe to 33777. I will get out the baked potato soup recipe here in a little bit. Uh, I will keep taking your phone calls. Uh, we've got 30 seconds here, so I can't get any more calls in this segment. But when we come back, I will. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC. That's 877-973-7425 if you want to call. And we got to move on to other things, including the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. There actually are local radio stations around this country who are turning over their signals to the Russian propaganda network, and you may not even know it. And there's actually a story there. Just a quick time out from the show to thank one of my favorite sponsors, one of the products I use on a daily basis multiple times. That would be my Quip electric toothbrush. And I really am a customer, and I really was before they started advertising for me. That's the way I like to do these ads. I like to endorse a product I'm already using, and Quip is one that I use, my wife uses, and both of my kids use, and we've used it before I started advertising. They make great electric toothbrushes. They're not the super fancy expensive ones, and you get a better clean. Why do you get a better clean? Well, because the quip you brush your teeth for two minutes and it pulses every 30 seconds so you know how to reposition it in your mouth and for those two minutes dennis wants you to brush your teeth for two minutes you get a great clean with great sonic vibrations that really get your teeth clean and you know i've got invisalign braces so i've got those attachments a lot of stuff gets stuck in them and behind the little attachments and with the quip i can always clean my teeth the way they need to be clean it is a great toothbrush and it's not going to break the bank it's just well made you can tell it's made by dennis and designers together if you go to getquip.com slash erickson right now you can get a quip and you can start with a brush head refill subscription where every three months they send you a new brush head they even include a battery and you get your first refill for free that's your first refill free at getquip.com slash erickson it's g-e-t-q-u-i-p.com slash erickson e-r-i-c-k-s-o-n quip the good habits company it is eric erickson welcome the eric erickson show one day I'll get over this congestion. Good Lord, uh, I am ready for this to be done. The phone number, 404, no, that's the wrong phone number. I'm not going to give you people my cell phone. Uh, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Uh, it is E-R-I-C-K. Those of you who get to dial in and you're at E-R-I-C on the phone and you're like, where's the, why this isn't ringing? You got to put in the K too. 877-973-7425. I am going to go start this hour uh, as I did the last hour. I'm going to start here with Eddie in Athens. Welcome. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. Good. I was calling about the William Barr. I heard the the, uh, the interchange that he had with the, uh, the reporter, and it sounds like he's saying, you know, when I was confirmed, I sat there and I told the senators that I wasn't going to do this, and, you know, the bullet... The press wasn't going to bully me. And then finally he said the president wasn't going to bully me. And so I think that he's doing a favor. He's, he's just saying that president, you know, president, it makes it hard. I was going to do what you wanted me to do anyway because I thought he, it sounded like he thought it was excessive, the seven to nine for uh, Stone. 
and he was going to check into it anyway and do something about it. But then the president came along and tweeted, which gives all the conspiracy theorists on the left, <laughs> right. you know, fodder. Yeah, you know, listen, Eddie, that is a great point. Yes, uh, let me go back to this clip because because I got it queued up here. Uh, this is the, the initial interview, the initial exchange between William Barr and the ABC News reporter. You'll hear the ABC News reporter first. The U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia signed off on his name is on the recommendation that went in there. Yeah. How did that happen? Uh, on Monday, uh, he came by uh, to briefly chat with me and say that uh, the team very much wanted to recommend the seven to nine year to the judge. And, but he thought that there was a way uh, of uh, satisfying everybody and providing more flexibility. Uh, and there was a brief discussion of that. I was under the impression uh, that what was going to happen was very much that I had suggested, which is deferring to the judge and then pointing out various factors and circumstances. Uh, on Monday night, uh, when I first saw the news reports, I said, gee, the news is spinning this. This is not what we were uh, going to do. So you were surprised? Uh, I was very surprised. And uh, once I confirmed that that's actually what we filed, I said that night, uh, to my staff that we had to get ready because we had to do something in the morning to amend that and clarify what our position was. I had made a decision that I thought was fair and reasonable uh, in this particular case. And uh, once the tweet occurred, the question is, well, uh, now what do I do? And uh, do you go forward with what you think is the right decision or do you pull back because of the tweet? And he didn't pull back. It, it, so... It... Yes, William Barr was not going to be bullied by the president. He was going to do what he thought was right. And, the, you know, the, the media conspiracy theorists out there just keep blowing him up over the stuff. And I don't think they they should. And, and some of them, to be fair, uh, some of the more reasonable voices at, at CNN, at least, are, are willing to give him the doubt. But most of them are. Don Lemon and, and others are blowing him up. At MSNBC, of course, they're convinced that this is all spin and he's he's not really telling the truth. Um, I, hmm, I, I like William Barr and behind the scenes, a lot of the Democrats who are blasting him in public like William Barr and Barr, Barr's a big boy. He gets the joke. Uh, these guys got to play to the crowd and in playing to the crowd they're they're they fundraise off their contempt for Barr and it's, it's Kabuki theater and he gets it. He understands it. He's willing to go along with it because, he thinks it's the right thing to do, and and I think it's the right thing to do. He's got to he's got to placate the president. He knows how to uh, navigate around the president to do what he thinks is right, and he's going to do it. Um, no reason to beat him up. Eight seven seven nine seven Eric eight seven seven nine seven three seven four two five. There's a story in the New York Times today, and and there are a couple of angles I want to take with this. Let me let me start out by reading you part of the story in the New York Times. Uh, when commuters spin the radio dial as they drive through Kansas City, Missouri these days, between the strains of classic rock and country hits, they can tune into something unexpected, Russian agitprop. In January, Radio Sputnik, a propaganda arm of the Russian government, started broadcasting on three Kansas City area radio stations during primetime drives, even sharing one frequency with a station rooted in the city's historic jazz district. Who needs a ridiculous Red Dawn invasion? A participant in one online forum wrote after the new broadcast, Your overlord, Mr. Putin, will be addressing you soon, so it's best to prepare now. Another commentator wrote, referring to Vladimir Putin of Russia, In the United States, talk radio on Sputnik covers the political spectrum from right to left, but the constant backbeat is that America is damaged goods. Sputnik's American hosts follow a standard talk radio format, riffing on the day's headlines and bantering with guests and callers. They find much to dislike in America, from the reporting on the coronavirus epidemic to the impeachment of President Trump, and they play on internal divisions as well. On a recent show, one host started by saying he was broadcasting live from Washington, D.C., capital of the divided states of America. Critics of Kansas City 
called Radio Sputnik's Arrival an unabashed exploitation. Critics in Kansas City called Radio Sputnik's Arrival an unabashed exploitation of American values and openness. They those behind the deal defended it as a matter of free speech and a simple business transaction. Peter Chartel, the owner of Alpine Broadcasting Corporation of Liberty, Missouri, the company airing Sputnik in Kansas City, said that he started the broadcast on January 1st, both because he liked what he heard during a trial run and because he was getting paid. The deal was brokered by RM Broadcasting, a Florida firm that hunts for airtime to sell to Rosiga Sedognia, the Russian state media organization behind Sputnik. Last year, a federal judge ruled against RM Broadcasting's owner, Arnold Ferralito, after he sued to prevent the Justice Department from forcing him to register as a foreign government agent. The ruling outraged Mr. Ferralito, who said he first he made his first deal to get Russian state radio on the air in the United States in 2009. They're paying for airtime, and I make a percentage, he said in an interview. I'm not being paid to represent the Russian government. Anyone tuned to Sputnik on 104.7 FM while driving across the historic 18th and Vine District in Kansas City, Missouri, will find that it fades for a few minutes of music from KOJH, a call letters referred to Kansas City's oldest jazz house, before Sputnik takes back over. For years, Anita Dixon, a community organizer, dreamed of creating a radio station built around the music of Count Basie and Charlie Parker, Miss, uh, both Kansas City natives, by the way. But Sputnik dominates the same frequency. What was supposed to be a historic jazz station and a historic jazz community is now broadcasting Alex Jones and Sputnik. Ever heard the expression of being sold up the river? That's how it felt. Mr. Chartel disputed the notion Kansas City is getting Sputnik instead of jazz. Radio Sputnik does beam its signal on the same frequency as KOJH, he said, but outside the limited geographic area awarded to the Mutual Music Foundations for the nonprofit low power jazz station. But she's still upset. Um, y'all, this is kind of a problem. Uh, do you know what Sput- Radio Sputnik is? We have the Voice of America. And we broadcast in on shortwave radio to countries. Uh, and we air it in multiple languages, and it was always a, a fairly good news service. The Voice of America. When I grew up in Dubai in the 1980s, I had a shortwave radio. I loved shortwave radio when I was a kid. Uh, and we, you could get the the BBC. You could get Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC. You could get the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. You could get Radio Moscow. Radio Moscow was the propaganda arm of the Soviet Union. Radio Moscow would, would would spread fear across the planet and, and have you believe that everything was hunky-dory in the Soviet Union. After Chernobyl, it was Radio Moscow that was broadcasting the propaganda that it was all a, an American plot to sow division in Russia. Well, when the Soviet Union fell, Radio Moscow became Radio Sputnik. It's still the propaganda arm of the Soviet Union. And there are those who hate this country, who live in this country, who will say, well, what's fair is fair. We broadcast the Voice of America. They should be able to broadcast Radio Sputnik here. The moral equivalence of evil. The reality is this is a propaganda arm of Vladimir Putin, and we should all be a little troubled that he's uh, buying up frequencies in the United States. You know, the, the Voice of America doesn't actually have hubs in Moscow. We broadcast by shortwave radio, and people can pick it up there on shortwave radio. Uh, we don't have, we're not buying up radio stations in, the, in Russia to broadcast the Voice of America, but they're doing it here, and we should be really concerned. Also, you've got a number of cable outlets airing Russia Today, the, the Russian propaganda TV service. I know people who've gone on there. And we really should be concerned that there are Americans who are turning to Russia to get their American news. The the, the, people have become so distrustful. And, you know, there's a lot to to learn here for the American media, that there is so much to distrust in the American media. There are some people who are willing to turn to Moscow to get straight news. They shouldn't because Moscow is serving Vladimir Putin's interests. They're not serving the interests of truth any more than the American media is serving truth as opposed to the Democratic Party. There's a problem. But there's another problem here, too. You know, the New York Times has been willing to run propaganda from China. Qatar spends a ton of money on Al Jazeera and the like in this country, 
and the media gives Al Jazeera a pass. If we're going to be upset about Russia, a Sputnik radio and Russia Today, RT television and, and the like, shouldn't we be upset about the money Qatar is spending? Because Qatar increasingly is not only hostile to the United States, but aligned with Iran. And Qatar is propping up Al Jazeera, which is Al-Qaeda's favorite TV network. We should be concerned about Sputnik Radio in the United States. But we should also be concerned about the Confucius Institutes around this country uh, that the media has long defended as, as uh, international cooperation between the United States and China when we now know that the Confucius Institute, thanks to a congressional investigation led by Marco Rubio, uh, is a propaganda outfit of the communist uh, PLA, the People's Liberation Army. The Chinese have been uh, putting editorials, paid editorials in the Washington Post and the New York Times for years. The Washington Post and the New York Times have turned a blind eye to them. And it makes me wonder if uh, Russia Today or Sputnik Radio were willing to advertise in the New York Times. Would the New York Times be taking their money or doing this? Or is, is it purity because it's Russians, because they blame the Russians for getting Donald Trump elected, but they'll turn a blind eye to the Chinese and the Qataris? None of us should turn a blind eye to any of it, and the problem is that so much of the media has been so badly distorted and is so willing to be distorted that that they're only covering half the story. They're not covering the full story. Foreign governments buying up airtime, newspaper pages, and TV to broadcast propaganda to the United States to make you think that your country is broken and their countries are A-OK. They are broadcasting fear, lies, and distortions, but that's what the New York Times does on a daily basis on its front page and in its editorial board. The New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, and the like have gone so far off the deep end when it comes to Trump derangement syndrome, they can't tell the truth on anything. They spend all their time on the Trumpian soap opera ignoring the rest of the news of the day. So here comes Sputnik Radio in Russia today and tells you what's happening in China with the coronavirus. And it may be spin, it may be lies, it may be distortions, and it may be inflated. But at least they're telling you about something other than the Trump administration you want to know about. They, they'll tell you about Judge Reinhardt, the, the liberal lion on the federal bench who's accused of harassment of law clerks and others now. He's under investigation. You won't hear that on CNN. They love the guy, and they're focused on the Trumpian and, uh, soap opera. The reason Sputnik News can set up shop in Kansas City is the same reason that the Qatari news outlets can run al-Qaeda and propaganda pieces. It's the same reason the Chinese can run in the newspapers. It's because nobody trusts the newspapers and the TV stations and the newsrooms of America to get things right. And so they're tuning them out. Their ratings are down. they got to get more money, so they're willing to take their money. And it, it, it seeds all sorts of fear and doubt out there. And then they get into all sorts of clickbaity stories because they got to get the clicks. They got to get the clicks to get the money. IGN, a, a technology web service. Let me read you this headline. NASA spots potentially hazardous asteroid rapidly approaching Earth. Thank God it's almost over. Sweet meteor death is on its way. No, but wait. When you actually read the story, NASA has confirmed that an asteroid larger than the tallest man-made structure in the world is currently traveling towards Earth at a speed of almost 34,000 miles per hour. Thankfully, it'll likely miss us by a few million miles. First of all, everything in space travels fast. Secondly, you, you blow this up, you get a sensational headline, and then at the end of the first paragraph, oh, it's going to miss us by a few million miles. But hey, if you said asteroid most likely won't impact planet Earth, is that going to get you the clicks? No. You got to do it. A sweet meteor death is on its way, people. We're all going to die. And then the subtitle is, except NASA says that's highly unlikely. Russia Today and Sputnik News can buy up time around the country on radio and TV stations and have people tune in because they already know that the American media outlets are full of crap. So they're going to go to them instead. At least they're willing to get a broader range of topics. But the problem is that underweaving all of it is the United States is incompetent. The government's falling apart. Everybody hates each other. and There's a new civil war on the rise. And if you hear that long enough, you believe it is true and you act on it. And it's not true. Did you know that when you're off of social media, people who are on social not on social media, live happier existences and think more highly of the country and their neighbors than people who are wrapped into roped into Facebook and Twitter and the like. 
the world is not falling apart and the United States is not falling apart. And despite our civil disagreements in this country and the rise of a crazy bunch of woke people on the left, the nation is actually doing quite well. And people have become so focused on Washington, D.C., they are not focused on their local community. And that's the actual problem we face in this country. It's not a bunch of idiots in Washington running the place, Democrat and Republican alike. It's that you people are so focused on Washington, you've forgotten to pay attention to the homeless man down the street in your local community, and you don't even know the name of your next door neighbor. If you want to improve the country, do that. Fix that. Work on that. Don't tune into communist propaganda. And by the way, the Russians, they're a bunch of commies still. And why do we need Sputnik today? We got a bunch of commies running for president and running the editorial page of the New York Times. Um, This is apparently not a joke. There's, uh, you didn't remember Crystal Pepsi. They have come up with a Pepsi engagement ring that's actually made with crystal Pepsi. This has got to be an April Fool's joke. Who would want it? I have no idea. Okay. Nonetheless, we move on. Uh, You know, speaking of the media, by the way, uh, one of the things that they're really outraged about is Stars and Stripes. Stars and Stripes is the magazine of the military. And Defense Secretary Mark Esper on Thursday defended the Pentagon's effort to strip Stars and Stripes of all its federal funding as part of its fiscal year 2021 budget request, telling reporters in Brussels that the independent news organization is not a priority. Pentagon officials acknowledged Wednesday for the first time the budget proposal completely cuts the subsidy that the department provides Stars and Stripes to print and distribute newspapers to troops deployed around the world, including remote and often dangerous locations in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Now, this is from Stars and Stripes, but the rest of the media is outraged by it. I, I You know, the media works overtime attacking churches and uh, faith-based organizations that get government funding to do nonprofit work. And yet they want government subsidies for themselves. The, the media is totally okay with government subsidized national public radio, and they're totally okay with government subsidized stars and stripes. Uh, but God forbid you let a parent send their kid to a private school that's run by a Catholic ministry or, or a small Baptist church. Can't do that. The hypocrisy knows it's knows no bounds when it comes to these issues. When we come back, let's finally talk about Bernie Sanders. I've put it off all day. We finally need to do it. Bernie Sanders, we got to talk about him. But first, I, I, I got to there's a story out there that if you play golf, apparently you you live longer than everybody else. I need to get back. You know, I'm terrible at golf. Uh, and I love to play it. My, my 11 year old wants to play golf. We've got a, we got a place near us called the Brickyard here in Macon. And I keep thinking I need to go join them, uh, cause it's pretty reasonable and I can get my son out there and we can actually have something we do together besides play Minecraft on the Xbox or throw the football. Um, I, yeah, it, it, despite how terrible I am at football, we actually do throw the football. Uh, usually we would throw a little one in the house, but, but he wants to play golf. And I like to hit golf balls. I'm just really, really terrible at it. You know, when I was in law school, I shouldn't be telling you the story, but I'm going to. What the heck? Um, <laughs> when when I was in law school, uh, I worked at a law firm, and the, the one of the partners would host a lot of parties, and he could go to the store, and he could get um, beer and liquor for the parties, and he could return unopened bottles of liquor, but he couldn't return the beer, and so he would give it to me as the law clerk, and I would fill up my fridge. Bridge and uh, myself and a group of my buddies, we used part of our law school loans to pay for our memberships at a local golf course. They gave student discounts, and we would pay, and we would load up a cooler full of beer on 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 days where we were not in school. I'm telling you, you're, you're third year in law school. All you do is play golf and, and drink, and you, you you do very little study. You don't even have to go to class, uh, even though we did. But we would go hit golf balls, and and we would be highly inebriated and have to sober up at the at the at the um at the restaurant at the golf course before we could go home um it was always a lot of fun but as a result i I got good at drinking beer and never got good at playing golf or and need to at some point do that i go to hilton head every year uh for a week and hit golf ball so maybe i'll live a little longer but i need to i need to join the brickyard i guess with my son because he really wants to play uh i i really actually think he just wants to ride drive the golf cart nonetheless 
Um, if you play, studies are showing, multiple studies now, according to what is this, the New England Journal of Medicine, that you will live longer than those who do not play golf. So good for you people. Um, man, lawyers live in forever. That's a scary thought. Bernie Sanders is consolidating his lead in the Democratic Party. I, I mentioned in the first hour, Joe Biden has electile dysfunction. It is, it's bad. Uh, I, my buddy Chris Burns, who the president of Dynamic Money, you've heard his ad, you hear his voice on this program. He fills in for me. He's a, a brilliant guy. He's been helping our family with our budgeting, retirement planning, and all of that. You too can use Dynamic Money. They're in Atlanta, but they'll video chat with you. Uh, go to dynamicmoney.com. Very reasonable. They're fee, they're fee only. They don't do a commission they're not going to sell you anything uh they're kind of pr- think of them as primary care physician for your money uh they'll work with your insurance guy your finance guy your investment guy and make sure everything is working according to what you need uh but uh i i, I digress in that regard but it, it, chris went on tv and i gave him a great talking point that has been true of every election since eisenhower There has never been a candidate for either party to lose the nomination of that party when they have been up for 22 weeks in the polls. Until now, Joe Biden looks, and I have said all along, Joe Biden is the man to to beat, and it looks like they're going to beat him. He he is uh, nationally, Biden is not doing well. He has nosedived in the polling. He trickled down, trickled down, trickled down, and now he's just droopy. It is it is very droopy. He needs some electoral Viagra. He is now, uh, Sanders is 4.4 percentage points ahead of him in the polling. He's at 23.6. Biden is down to 19.2. Bloomberg, who has done nothing but spend money, is at 14.2. Bloomberg has spent more money already in campaign 2020 than Barack Obama spent the entire campaign in 2012. That's pretty freaking impressive. Now, Biden, for his part, says he looks forward to heading off into Nevada. Um, And I'm going to get a chance to debate uh, Mayor Bloomberg. I'm going to get a chance to debate him on everything from redlining to stop and frisk Mm. to a whole range of other things. Oh, in Nevada, they're going to go have a debate in Nevada. The the, the, uh, caucus in Nevada is next week. Well, let me play you some Bernie Sanders. Welcome back to the News Hour. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Judy. So are you now the front runner? I'll let you make that determination. All I know is we're working really hard. We're proud that we won the popular vote in Iowa, won the New Hampshire primary. Uh, I think we've got a good shot in Nevada and South Carolina. We'll just keep going. And a couple of more from him. And following up on that, you have called for the breakup of ICE and CBP. So what exactly would you do to secure the southern border of the United States of America? Well, we have a lot of good technology out there. I mean, we need to protect the borders. We need to do that in a way that does not build walls, that does not separate us uh, from our neighbors. Uh, And I think using modern technology, uh, having sufficient manpower uh, to do the job will do it. But here is the bottom line. I mean, the bottom line is that America cannot simply build walls. Uh, We look foolish Uh, to the rest of the world, you look foolish to Mexico, and that is something that I will not do in my administration. So I think the time is long overdue for us to be clear that health care is a human right for all, including, by the way, the undocumented in this country. A couple of more. So what I believe is there should be a guaranteed federal jobs program. If you are capable of working, there should be a decent paying job for you. There should be job training to make sure you can get that job, education available to you so that you have the skills to do that work. And the last one for Ernie, this one is the most controversial. Hear it for yourself. There has been legislation passed that increasingly dangerous people who choose, and many people do choose, to get into sex work, many of whom are LGBTQ and or women. What is your plan to work with the sex worker community to not only legalize and regulate sex work, but to make, make it safer for all women and our LGBTQ community to participate? Well, we will do everything that we can uh, to make sure that sex, work, sex workers are, are treated with respect, that they are not harassed, that they are not murdered, that they are not beaten. Uh, the question of legalizing sex work is something that we are looking at, uh, but we have not yet reached a conclusion. I want to hear from a whole lot of people. Uh, to help me reach the best conclusion that we can. 
I'm actually kind of surprised he hasn't gone on and gone there. You know, this is a big thing on the left now, and it's dividing the feminist movement as to whether or not you should legalize uh, prostitution in this country. Uh, there is so much data out there showing that many of the people who claim to be willfully and voluntarily employed as sex workers actually aren't. Uh, they're there due to addiction or abuse or, or human trafficking. And there's a whole lot of data out there that you legalize human, you legalize prostitution, you increase human trafficking. So I'm kind of surprised Bernie's restrained because the, the, the young feminist movement out there thinks that it, it's empowering to be a prostitute to make money off your body. And uh, Sanders has a lot of them supporting. By the way, did y'all hear about the feud with, with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Apparently Sanders campaign admonished her that she's going out on the campaign trail for him and she's never bringing him up and they don't like that. Uh, but all of these positions with Bernie Sanders put Bernie Sanders remarkably to the left of mainstream America. It, none of the Democrats are actually moderate. Even Pete Buttigieg, who the media loves to say is moderate. We'll get to Buttigieg here in a minute if we have time. Uh, he, he, the, the media loves to say that Buttigieg is moderate, and he's not in his positions. He's just moderate in the way he talks about them. And that's the big issue for the media. It's how you talk about them. Uh, Sanders is willing to come out and say health care for illegal aliens, and and we're going to ban the, the, the Customs and Border Patrol. We're going to break up the department in sanctuary cities for all and we're going to put commies on the Supreme Court and pack the court and all this and and no you can't be pro-life and be in the Democratic Party it, it it's the the willingness of the media to point out these things about Bernie you know if he's actually the nominee they will avoid like the plague pointing this stuff out they will go into true believer mode and let out there any commie inner commie to defend Bernie Sanders well uh, Tom Perez is starting to get asked about is Bernie Sanders too far left does the Democratic Party have a socialism problem with Bernie Sanders is it or will it be Bernie Sanders who can tap into that broad base, that fundraising base that he has, and keep this going as long as as anyone is standing? How do you bring the party together across this ideological divide? Well, you know, I think the real uh, thing that folks understand is that what unites us far exceeds what our differences are. There's no ideological divide on the need to ensure that people with pre-existing conditions to keep their health care. There's no ideological divide about the need to ensure that we hold pharmaceutical companies accountable so that we can lower the cost of prescription drugs. There's no ideological divide on the need to make sure that one good job should be enough. The difference is between the uh, Democratic Party candidates and Donald Trump, whoever the nominee is, are 100 percent. Yeah, that that's that's good spin from Tom Perez, except they got a real problem. And this is why Bloomberg is starting to increase in the polls as people begin to freak out about the performance issues of Joe Biden on the campaign trail. They got to have somebody. They got to have somebody as an alternative to Sanders. And when you look at the lay of land, let, let me get into real clear politics here. By the way, this is a resource. I don't want to encourage you to not rely on me, but um, this is an, an actual good resource that you – uh, go to realclearpolitics.com. dot com. They, they've got all. They keep the polling averages up, and the polling averages are actually really good. They're the best way to figure things out. Um, so nationally, right now, Sanders is in the lead. But when you look at the polling state by state, you've got Nevada has Biden in the lead. South Carolina has Biden in the lead. California has Sanders in the lead. Texas has Biden in the lead. Uh, but a lot of those polls actually are kind of outdated now. We don't have a lot of new data from these states. And of course, the, the polling isn't a reliable indicator for the um, for the, the for where the candidates are. So, for example, the last polling we have for the Nevada caucus is the USA Today poll, and it was completed at the beginning of January. We don't have it uh, for South Carolina. The last poll we have was completed uh, February 2nd by East Carolina University. Uh, the Post Courier poll had Biden up five. The East Carolina University had him up 18. That's not reliable polling. Uh, the Texas polling, the latest we have is the Texas Tribune poll that had Sanders up two. The Dallas Morning News that ended January 30th had Biden up 16. Uh, it appears to be the outlier. The Texas Lyceum poll had only Biden up two. 
uh, there's a real problem there and we don't have a ton of state by state polling let me let me do some of the rundowns for you that we have out now uh, we got a Georgia Democratic primary poll from WSB TV Landmark. It has Biden up 18. It came out today. We've got a Florida Democratic presidential primary that has uh, Bloomberg up one over Joe Biden. Bloomberg 27, Biden 26. Uh, we've got the the Texas matchups have have Texas uh, beating everybody. Had a North Carolina poll yesterday that had Biden up four. Uh, we got Trump beating everybody in Alabama, Jeff Sessions ahead of everybody. Uh, you, you get the point. There's not a ton of state by state polling and the polling that we have from a lot of these, they're, they're not great pollsters, uh, and, and no disrespect intended, but just to, to educate you a little bit on the polling, Quinnipiac is an educational institution and it has, has a historic track record of doing very good polls. Uh, Quinnipiac, we can tell from the polling, we can tell from the um, from the history, we can tell that they've got a good polling track record. The problem is Quinnipiac is not the most accurate. Quinnipiac actually doesn't have a huge accuracy record, but it get, it's in the ball game. It's in the ball game. It's always close. But the University of Georgia has started doing polling here in Georgia, and the University of Georgia polling has never been great thus far. I mean, take, for example, the UGA poll they did with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I don't mean any disrespect intended. This is just the way it works. Uh, academic institutions that want to get a name for themselves, they want to teach their students statistics. They start a polling center. It's a great project. They have fun. Don't believe them. UGA is a prime example of this. Look at the modeling for the UGA uh, AJC poll on uh, Governor Kemp. Uh, they asked in the poll at, to kind of get a metric here. Uh, did you vote for Donald Trump in 2016? We know the outcome of 2016, so the polling should be weighted towards that. Donald Trump got 48. Hillary Clinton got 45. In the UGA poll, Trump got 41. Hillary got 45. So it looks like they accurately counted Hillary's vote and they undercounted Donald Trump's vote. You readjust it based on that. And suddenly, Brian Kemp has, instead of 54% approval, he's got over 60% approval, which is more accurate. I've seen a lot of private polling that has that. Uh, now, it, it's not just UGA. So the, take this North Carolina poll. It's Biden up four. It came out yesterday. It's Biden 24, Sanders 20, Bloomberg 16, Warren 11. It's by High Point. I, 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 what is High Point? High Point University. I've never heard of them. This is a sample size of 1,100 adults, 292 live interview telephones, 808 online interviews. Don't believe the online interviews. You've got to look for people. you got to look for pollsters who do phone calls, not online. You want to do a random sample of phone polls, cell phones, and live numbers, uh, landlines and cell phones. The more cell phone numbers you have, the better off your polling is going to be. That's why Gallup took a break in the presidential polling because they had screwed up so bad. They took a break, they readjusted, and now they do cell phones. Now, you're sitting out there saying, because I get this all the time, we have calls every time I bring this up. I'm surprised we don't have one right now. We get a call in saying, but I never get a poll phone call, and how can the polling be right when I've never gotten a phone call? Well, we're a nation of 350 million people, and they're surveying 1,000 people. And if you know anything about statistics, you know that you can survey 1,000 people based on 350 million people and get a pretty good idea of what those 350 million people think based on that 1,000-person survey. And the reason you're not getting a phone call, do you want to get a phone call? Because Georgia is rapidly becoming a battleground state. I'll tell you how you can get this. You go to your local board of elections and you update your voter registration file and you make sure your cell phone is attached. If you've got your cell phone attached to your voter registration card on file with the secretary of state, you're going to start getting polling phone calls. How do I know? Because I get polling phone calls, but they don't want to talk to me because I'm technically a member of the media. So they hang up on me when they say, are you a member of the media? Yes. Click. They're done. But you go put your cell phone number 
in your voter registration file with your local board of elections. It will translate up to the Secretary of State's global voter file. And when people come calling for the updated voter file, which will be updated in the middle of the year, you will start getting telemarketing calls from pollsters who want to know what you think about the world, and you can have an impact on the country. Most people's cell phones aren't attached to their voter file. You do it, and suddenly... It's amazing how many phone calls you're going to get, and you will hate life and hate the fact that you did it. But, hey, you'll be getting those pollsters calling. I'm not excited about this new Batman movie. Robert Pattinson, he's from the, the what, the Twilight series. They've released some some footage of him in his Batman costume, and I'm just I'm I'm waiting for DC to screw it up. Uh, it looks like they they've modeled him on Netflix's uh, Marvel's Daredevil. If y'all haven't seen, man, if you've got Netflix, now you need to be you need to be older. You need to be sixteen, or really eighteen and up, uh, but sixteen be acceptable, I guess. Uh, you should watch the first season of Daredevil on Netflix's streaming service. It's phenomenal. You can get it on iTunes as well now. In fact, I bought it off iTunes. Um, it really is phenomenal. Um, it takes faith seriously. Daredevil is, is a practicing Catholic. The actor who plays Daredevil is a practicing, very devout Catholic. And it takes faith seriously. And it's just a well-done series. And man, the finale... Um, where the bad guy, uh, Kingpin, does a dissertation. I mean, he really does a theological deep dive on the Good Samaritan in the New Testament. It, it, it's a good series. And, and I'm I'm not excited about DC. And you know, they've got that Birds of Prey movie out now. And it is bad. And it it's actually highlighting that um, you can't really trust movie critics anymore. Because there are a lot of critics who praise the movie, and when you actually read the review, the reason they praise the movie is because it's woke. It got woke, and in, in, in wokeness we trust. I mean, there are a lot of people in these movie reviews, they give it two thumbs up, and they're like, the movie's actually not great, but it's great to see empowered female superheroes undermining the patriarchy. I, I, I wish I was making that up. Uh, that that's paraphrasing one of the movie reviews, and of course you got the little emo beta male uh, movie reviewers out there too. Is it, it it it's a feminist masterpiece, and I love it so I can get a date. No, the movie's actually really bad, according to the people who've seen it. It's it's bad, uh, and and you can't trust movie. I mean, a lot of people say you never could trust movie reviewers, but there's always been some movie reviewers you could trust. And Rotten Tomatoes has always been a fairly good aggregator of those reviews, but now you can't even trust it because so many of the movie reviewers are all about woke. Oh, it's a feminist masterpiece, or or you, you've got two gay characters in it, therefore it checks the box. It's diverse enough. We can watch it. No, I just want a good movie. I don't want a woke movie. I, I just want a good plot, and DC's failing on the superhero front.